right, and welcome back to Reimagine 2020. Here we are in the fifth edition, and we're speaking with what is now a uh, reimagined stalwart, uh, an old hand at the reimagined game, and certainly a, an experienced player in the crypto sphere overall. Uh, we're talking, of course, about none other than Mark Yusko. Mark, again, I want to thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Uh, so much uh, changes month to month, and despite you having had such fantastic conversations uh, with my colleague Patrick, there's always so much more to discuss. Well, no, thanks, Asher. I, I really enjoy these these sessions, and uh, as we were talking about uh, kind of before we came on air, and you have a much better accent than uh, Patrick. So while I miss talking to him, uh, we'll have some fun today. Yeah, certainly, I think we will, and I think we will most most importantly because. You know, uh, you've been, uh, you know, working here alongside Reimagine, coming on for these great conversations since all the way back in May, which, you know, this year feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, <laughs> certainly, certainly does to me, uh, I guess, to everyone uh, around the world. But, it, you know, it's important to sort of look back over the year. You know, we sort of get to these, these, these you know, end of year epithets and people start to sort of think about the, the, the epilogue to 2020 and look forward to 2021. But, you know, standing here, at uh, this you know, juncture in December. Looking back towards May, uh, what would you say are the grand themes for the year, perhaps obvious, some and perhaps less obvious that really stand out uh, for the period uh, sort of over 2020? Yeah, I, I think the, the most obvious and, and the biggest is, is, is kind of the whole purpose of, of having this, this event, which is you know, the, uh, the wrecking ball that was, was COVID-19 has, has really uh, just come crashing down on this whole idea that digital disruption is years away. In fact, I've been using this cartoon of this company and the CEO sitting around a board table on the penthouse of this building. And he's saying, you know, I don't, I don't think digital disruption is going to come for a number of years. We're, we don't have to change at all. And there's a big old wrecking ball right outside the window of COVID-19. And, and that, that has clearly happened. And so this you know, digital disruption, these digital trends that were, were already started uh, have just been accelerated by two, three, four years. And I think that is, that is monstrous. We're seeing it in, in the crypto markets. We're seeing it in the blockchain technology adoption. We're seeing it in, in just, you know, the use of video conferencing software like this and the virtualization, realizing that a lot of travel probably wasn't necessary per se. Uh, I'm still a big fan of face-to-face. -face. I'm, I'm kind of tired of this, this whole presumed sick and that everyone should be afraid of everybody else. I think that's silly. You know, we as a human species have been dealing with viruses for thousands of years. This is no different than any other one we faced. Uh, why we're treating it differently, I don't really understand. I'm sure that'll come out later. Um, but I, I do think the big trend is this, this uh, move towards digital. I think some more subtle things are... Uh, I don't think anybody really uh, has thought about or, or is thinking about uh, some of the things that are kind of related to uh, the, the lockdown, kind of not the virus itself, but the response to the virus. You know, it's interesting. It's kind of like, you know, the virus isn't the problem in your body, right? It's your body's response to the virus. Some people's body fights it off, no problem, no symptoms, no, no ill effects. Other people's body goes into significant distress. Uh, and it's like Pasteur said, it's, it's not the germ, it's the landscape. And I think it was the response, this lockdown response that I think people are really not paying attention to. And there's a great quote, I can't remember who said it, but uh, liberties are easily taken, but very tough to reinstate. And uh, you know, some of our, I mean, I just, I just got off a call this morning. Uh, we have a partner that, that runs our, our China presence. We do some growth equity investing in China. And he's been, you know, in Singapore really since kind of March, April, when he wasn't allowed back in the country uh, after being on a trip home for the Lunar New Year. And make a long story short, he, he went back and he is literally sitting in a hotel room, uh, quarantined for two weeks. So they picked him up off the plane, gave him a test. Even though he tested negative, he still had to go to this state-sponsored hotel and get locked in a room with no heat or air conditioning. And it's about eight degrees Celsius. So he is literally in a parka and a ski hat in his, 
room, you know, just sitting there. So I, I, that's weird, right? That is, that is a very right. strange thing uh, just to so, want to travel. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, certainly a, a, a sort of tale of woe there, I, I guess. So sort of projecting out here, and I, I don't want to sort of make the full pivot yet to, uh, to the grand 2021 conversation, but just to touch on it a little bit at this point, I guess, like, you know, you say that the digital, uh, you know, digital revolution has arrived and, and now uh, the digitization of, of of business and of society has occurred, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, pushed ahead by, by yeah. COVID and the response to it. But is this, I mean, do you think we're going to look back at this as a, as a generational tipping point? I mean, is this, is this it? Is this where we stand now? I mean, obviously there'll be changes in the future, but, but projecting out into some longer term effects, uh, you know, even though vaccines seem to be, uh, you know, right, uh, right there, right on the horizon, uh, is this still, uh, we don't go back to normal as it were pre 2020 after, uh, after all this is said and done? Look, I think there's there's two really important questions in that in that comment, Asher. And you know, one is this idea that you know we are at a generational shift, right? We are at a technological evolution, and we've been talking about this, you know, over the last five episodes of Reimagine. You know, if you think about the history of of technological evolutions, it it really uh, goes back into the 1950s and the, the advent of the, the mainframe computer. And there was a period of time when, you know, no one had computers, literally no one. I mean, the governments kind of invented them, so to speak. And then they, uh, they spun out of governments and, and you had these companies like Wang and DEC and IBM that uh, basically created computers, you know, big as a building to be available for, for businesses, big businesses. And then 14 years later, we had an innovation around the microchip and suddenly we could have smaller computers about the size of a room uh, that could sit in people's, you know, again, uh, kind of smaller mainframe style. And that revolutionized access to computing for small business. And everybody got a Spark workstation or, or whatever it was. And then 14 years later, we had this innovation around the personal computer. And uh, we found a way to miniaturize and put it on your desktop. And I remember my first clunky computer, I actually bought it from Adam Dell uh, from his dorm room at the University of Texas. And it was called PCs Limited. I should have kept it as a collector's item, but I didn't. And uh, it took three minutes to boot up. Think about waiting three minutes. We can't wait three <laughs> seconds for anything. Wait, think about waiting three minutes for your computer to cycle on. And, uh, but it, it changed work and it changed habits and it changed everything. And, and Steve Ballmer's mom famously quipped, you know, honey, why would you go to work for a company like that? Uh, no one would ever want a computer in their house. I was joking, he has 18 billion reasons he was right, mom was wrong. And then 14 years later though, we had an even bigger revolution or evolution, which was the advent of this, right? Mobile supercomputers. This little phone, it's not really a phone because no one talks on it. Um, it's a supercomputer. It, it's as powerful as some of the early supercomputers, and yet it's portable. And the mobile net uh, in 2010 was big. I mean, it changed everything. And now we're at this next wave, which is the trust net, or the literally the internet of everything, where everything is connected. And that will all be driven on blockchain. And blockchain is simply the operating system the same way that iOS and Android are operating system for this, the same way DOS and, and Windows are, are the operating system or the Mac OS uh, for, the, for the Apple, uh, back to you know, COBOL and Fortran for the big mainframes. And so operating systems are critically important. And when you think about everything in the world being connected, everything being digital, all commerce being digital, all exchange of value, every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of real estate, every private business, every everything will be digital. And money, okay, or value being transferred over internet protocol changes everything. I mean, MOIP might be the greatest innovation of this century. You know, and every century has, and you said generational shift, every century has a big innovation. And I think this money over IP is it for this generation. And, and as the wealth shifts from people like me, the boomers, to people like you, the millennials, that shift, it's not going back, right? I, I say there's this digital divide. You ask anyone over 35, who's your broker? Oh, Merrill Lynch, UBS, whatever. 
How much gold do you have? I don't know, three, four percent. How much Bitcoin do you have? Oh, are you kidding? It's a scam. It's a Ponzi. I right, zero. You know, it's all going to zero. Stupid. Ask anyone under 35. Who's your broker? What, what do you mean? What's a broker? I mean, I got a Robinhood trading account, but what's a broker? How much gold do you have? Oh, are you kidding me? The pet rock? Why would I own gold? How much Bitcoin do you have? I don't want to talk about it. Why not? Well, because it's a really big percentage of my net worth and I'm kind of embarrassed. So that is real and that is tangible and that is never going back. The genie is not going back in the bottle. We are not going back. And so the second part of that is what about this post COVID world, right? No, we are not going back to being free to move around the world, right? We are not going back to not having checkpoints. Um, like Qantas Airlines CEO said, you can't get on my plane unless you have proof, digital proof of a vaccine. That is insane. That is insane. Vaccines are not 100% effective. So forcing people to have one, right? That's a personal choice. You either want it or you don't. But that's a personal decision. The idea that you, it's a mandate, okay? And we don't even know if they're safe, let alone if they're effective. Now they say they're effective on 96 people. Okay, that's great. But we don't know if mRNA technology is safe. No chance I'm putting an MRA, uh, mRNA you know, uh, vaccine in my body. Zero chance. So now the government here in the US said that they would come into your house and force you, right? They would come into your house and pin you down and, and jab your arm. That's a scary world in which we're rapidly moving towards. So and I want to go down that rabbit hole because I, I, I don't like it. And mm. I, I keep t I tweet about this, right? It's not about the virus, right. not just about the virus. Um, this has never been just about the virus. This is just like the Patriot Act after 9-11, it was never just about the terrorist threat. It was definitely about surveillance, about taking away liberties. This is definitely more than just about the virus. But, but again, that's not what we want to talk about on, uh, on Reimagine, right? Uh, no, we can, we can cover any topic. No topic <laughs> here is, uh, is off, uh, off the cards. Uh, I, I will say, you know, though, it's, a, it's a stark picture you paint and I want, to, I want to drill down a little bit because, I mean, I love talking about this, this big level structural stuff, but, you know, I think we've got a, a good opportunity here and, you know, as we've been checking in with you over the months to, to drill down a little bit on the sort of more granular details of where we stand right at this point. Yep. Um, so, you know, looking here we are, early December 2020, uh, you know, Bitcoin has recently uh, tapped up against all-time highs. Yep. Uh, the time of recording sitting a little below, but who knows where it'll be by the time uh, this goes out to the public world and whenever people are actually watching where it'll be. Uh, but, you know, and we don't have to keep, keep this just for the cryptocurrency space because yeah. it's a whole interesting space. And I want to sort of get your, your gamut of opinions. You know, last time uh, I, I watched over your conversation with Patrick and, you know, this was uh, before the elections, obviously late, late October, uh, you know, in your mind, what's changed firstly in the wake of the elections, but also in terms of the political game, but also more, perhaps more importantly, in terms of the wider scale US centric, but also global financial macro picture and how might that impact cryptos and even beyond? Yeah, look, it's a really important question. And, and again, we're back to, to the response to the virus and, and the lockdown and, and what that did, right? I mean, the global lockdown has decimated global economic activity, absolutely decimated it. I mean, GDP growth around the world uh, has gone negative. We're gonna have our first global contraction of GDP in history. Just let that sink in for a second. It, well, I mean, in, in modern history. I mean, we've never had, even in the Great Depression, that was localized to the US and, and parts of Europe. It really wasn't broad-based and the, and the global GDP didn't contract. Uh, so we're gonna have global GDP contraction. We've got this, this rise in nationalism and populism. And that was going on even before the virus uh, that was moving us in, in the wrong direction, away from globalization, back to this kind of, you know, each tub on its own bottom mentality, which, which I just think is silly. Look, Adam Smith was right, you know, almost 500 years ago that the, uh, you know, comparative advantage works, right? If you're good at making sweaters and I'm good at, at growing corn, we should trade. I mean, that's just the way it works. I shouldn't try to make sweaters and you shouldn't try to grow corn. Um, but, you know, this idea that we should all be more uh, self-sufficient and we should go back to the old ways is, is, is just kind of silly. But here we are talking about it. And so the only way out for central governments in the West, look, the West has, has a huge problem. I call it the killer Ds. 
So you got bad demographics, right? Every day, people like me, you know, I'm not, I'm still a ways away, but every day, 10,000 people like me turn 65. Right, the baby boomers, 10,000 people every day in the United States turn 65. Same thing in Europe, 10,000 people turn 65. And it turns out 65 to 85 year old people are just not very productive. They're perfectly nice people and they're great, but they're not productive and they don't really contribute much to society. Like they take from society, they're dependent on society. And so productivity goes down, GDP growth goes down and, and there's nothing you can do about that, right? You can't grow people faster. Uh, we haven't figured out how to do that yet, although maybe in the future we will, um, but, but can't do that. So uh, the only solution is immigration, and we've gone the exact wrong direction on that. Immigration solves all the ills of bad demographics, but you know, we're too foolish to, to think about that. Um, and so then you have too much debt. And the reason you have so much debt is because of entitlements. So what's an entitlement? An entitlement is a promise you make to yourself that you don't fund and you ask your kids to pay for who wouldn't vote for that? Everybody would vote for that. Yeah, free money for me. And now we're reaching the point where everybody just wants free money, right? Nobody wants to go back to work, right? They just want the government to send them money. Universal basic income, dumbest idea I think I've ever heard. I mean, look, if creating wealth was as simple as printing money, wouldn't every country just do that? Wouldn't every country just print more money? Well, they've tried, right? Zimbabwe tried that, right? Argentina tried that. Venezuela tried that. And it's a horrible outcome. The Weimar Republic in Germany, post-World War I, tried that. It's just a bad strategy. So we have, we have debt that's trying to you know, service these entitlements. So bad demographics plus too much debt leads to deflation. Right? We have low and actually negative interest rates all around the world. We have the highest number, over 18 trillion. And let that number sink in for a second. $18 trillion of debt that is a negative yield. Capitalism breaks down with negative yields, right? Capitalism only works if I get paid for the use of my idle currency or my, my idle wealth, right? With negative, right? That's a wealth tax. That is a tax on the middle class and the poor to the rich, to the bankers. And so that is a total breakdown. We have 18 trillion. Remember, 1 trillion is a dollar every second. You and I would have to sit here and spend a dollar a second for 31,710 years. That's just a long time. That's a lot of money. And so $18 trillion of debt has negative interest rates, negative yields. And look, every interest rate on the planet is going negative because that's the only way out. Because what you have to do, when you have too much debt, right? You can either pay it back, never gonna happen. Europe can't pay their debt. Japan can't pay their debt. America can't pay their debt. No one can pay their debt. So you can default on it. Can't default on it because then the republic, I mean, then the, the, the politicians get kicked out of office. So they don't like that. So they're not going to default. You could restructure it, but in order to restructure, you have to have the person who owns the debt agree to the restructuring. Mm -hmm. And who's going to agree to lower interest rates, lower than negative, right? No one. Or you can deflate it away or, de or inflate it away by devaluing your currency. So that is what everybody's going to do. So the perfect storm. And I hate that term. I wish there was a, a positive, like inverse of perfect storm. Cause this is not like the perfect storm, like Marky, Marky Mark Wahlberg ship goes down and he dies. <laughs> this is the inverse of the perfect storm, like the perfect you know, uh, environment for cryptocurrencies, particularly Bitcoin, because when everyone in the world, right? The US, Europe, Japan, when everybody in the world is devaluing their currency, what happens is real money, sound money, gold and Bitcoin go up in value. And that's what we've seen year in, year out, the price of precious metals and the price of Bitcoin just keeps rising. And everybody who says, oh, well, you know, Bitcoin's gonna fail and Bitcoin's gonna go down. What, what you're missing is it could have failed, right? There was a time in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, plenty of opportunities for it to fail, but it didn't. And the miracle of Bitcoin was that it went from 0.003 cents to a dollar. That was the miracle. The miracle is not a, a dollar to $100 or $100 to $1,000 or $1,000 to $10,000 or $10,000 to $100,000. I mean, we'll be at $100,000 in Bitcoin sometime next year. And people say, oh, who could have thought that was coming? Well, it's easy. It's just math, right? Networks grow according to Metcalfe's law. They follow a parabolic curve. We can plot it out, right, with precision. And the price may not 
actually follow that curve exactly because human beings, you, you know, people like us, we have greed and we have fear. So in 2018, it got too high, right? The value was 10,000. It's where it should have been in late 2017, early 2018. And what happened, right? It got to 20,000. So it had to go down. Well, when it got back to fair value, people were, oh, well, it's got to keep going. So it went all the way down to 3,000. Well, 3,000 was too low. That was fear. So then it started to come back. And now, you know, fair value today is somewhere around where it is. So, you know, are we going to go way above fair value? Yeah, probably, because greed is an amazing thing. So fun times. I mean, I, I said I could talk about this all day and, and you'd like to ask some other questions. So I'll just stop. <laughs> no, you know what? I'm actually going to drill down in, even on what you just said uh, to, to hit with a little more, because this is this is something that, you know, obviously a, a lot of analysis centers around when it comes to Bitcoin. You know, there is these sort of fundamental mathematical equations that sort of uh, break it down we, you know, as a deflationary asset. Uh, you know, there's a, a limited supply, therefore, over time, as you, know, as you said, with Metcalfe's law and other mathematical uh, principles that are beyond my personal uh, you know, understanding, but I'll, I'll accept that uh, the experts uh, have it all figured out. But that being said, I mean, and I've asked this of a, of a few people we've uh, interviewed for this conference, but I'd love to get your opinion. What kills Bitcoin, if anything? Nothing. Can't. Can't kill it. Um, and, and that's, and it's, you know, bold statement because, oh, you can't say that. Well, no, I, I can, right? Um, every technological evolution has a chance of being killed, right? When we transitioned from, you know, microcomputers to personal computers, there was a chance and there were many chances, right? Apple almost died, right? Multiple times, Apple was almost out of business. And now Apple, I'm using an Apple computer. Lots of people have Apple computers. People would have thought, no, I could never have a computer that wasn't IBM. And so, you know, personal computing um, had a chance to die, but it, but it didn't. And, and it's, it's called the Lindy effect, right? The longer something survives, the longer it will survive. And, and that's true of anything, right? It, it's true of humans, right? If, if you have high infant mortality, then your life expectancy is low. It's not because people don't live a long life. They do. But a lot of people die at a young age, so the average life expectancy is, is low. When infant mortality goes away, not away completely, but, but gets reduced, then life expectancy goes up. That doesn't necessarily mean people are living longer. There are 100-year-olds for centuries. Now, we have more of them today, and we will have more of them in the future, but that's just because of advances in medical technology and advances in, in quality of life and less stress and less pollution. Um, but at the end of the day, people are still going to contract disease and people are going to die. That's just, you know, life and death. That's, that's the way, you know, human life occurs. But uh, these advances in technology um, allow us to get to a certain point where there is just no going back, right? There's, there's no chance that we're going to go back to a world in which we don't use computers. Uh, there's no chance we're going to go back to a world in which we don't have digital you know, assets, right? We had analog assets, right? right? Physical piece of paper. Like in the old days, you would have a stock certificate, a physical stock certificate. I would have a piece of paper, money, and we would exchange it, right? That would be a trade. Well, no one does that anymore. No one meets under the buttonwood tree in New York and exchanges physical pieces of paper, analog pieces of paper for pieces of paper. What do we do? We have those physical pieces of paper in a place in Texas called DTCC, Depository Trust, and that physical piece of paper still exists, but you and I trade a QSIP on an electronic form, a representation of that. Now, why is that less good than a digital form? Well, why do we need the physical piece of paper? Why don't we just have a digital certificate that you and I can trade? And why can't it be on a public blockchain where it can be fully transparent? We know who owns it. We don't need a trusted third party. We don't need to pay DTCC to hold our physical stock certificate. That's silly. Right? We can have a global computing network do that. And what it all comes down to, and the reason I say Bitcoin can't die and won't die, is what Bitcoin is, is simply the conversion of energy to value. Mm -hmm. And everything we do every day is converting energy to value. Right? You get up in the morning, you put fuel in your body, and you go do work. Whether you do physical labor and you make things, whether you have intellectual conversations and, and, and make ideas, whether you build things, whether you supervise things, whether you, you know, drive a bus or, or serve in a restaurant. 
we are converting energy to value. And the ability to store value in digital form, like we've stored value in lots of ways, right? We store value in the form of, of bank notes that we put in a bank and we turn them into ones and zeros. We turn them into electronic versions of those physical uh, pieces of currency. And that you know, is value that is stored. Or now you know, we can take gold bars and put them in a vault and that is value that is stored. But all you know, gold, the problem with gold is it's really heavy. It's really tough to transport. It's really tough to divide. Bitcoin's just better, right? It does all the things that gold does. It's more scarce than gold now after the most recent halving. And what it does, it allows us to permanently store value. It allows us to be you know, very divisible down to eight decimal points, you know, down to a Satoshi. And ultimately it will do all the things that gold has done for 5,000 years. I mean, think about it. There have been 875 paper currencies in the history of mankind. 75% of them no longer exist because they get deflated away. In fact, the pound sterling is the oldest. It's you know, been around 381 years, something like that. But here's the thing. In the early days, a pound note got you a pound of sterling silver, hence the name. Today, it takes 174 pounds of silver to get a pound note. That's called devaluation of the currency. And same thing, a dollar, you know, which we stole from the, uh, the Dutch, is called a dollar. So the dollar right, started in, 19, in 1776. From 1776 to 1913, a dollar in the United States was worth a dollar. There was inflation up and down around you know, wars, but basically a dollar is worth a dollar for all that time. And then we created the Fed and we gave the government unlimited fiat. They could create money out of thin air. And since then, a dollar is worth a nickel, right? We turned it into a coin. And so we're at this juncture where we can take energy, right? Electricity. And through this proof of work, global network of computers, the most powerful computing network on the planet, the most secure computing network on the planet, and through that conversion of energy into value, think about this, I can take natural gas that today is being flared in West Texas, right? It's just associated gas from drilling for oil, no pipeline, so what do they do? They burn it and release hydrocarbons into the, into the atmosphere, really bad. I can take a pipe, take that gas, put it on a turbine, turn it through a computer into Bitcoin and transfer it anywhere in the world over the internet instantaneously. I've now helped the environment, I've converted energy into value in a perfect storage form. There's no chance Bitcoin's going away, zero. So to, then to you, I mean, you know, and it's always an interesting point talking to, to investors in the space, talking to speculators in the space. And I know your credentials go back, uh, you know, a considerable way back to 2013, if I, if I remember my dates correctly. Yeah. Uh, nice. but, but, you know, I, I suppose I wonder, is this really about the, the tenets of the fundamental underlying technology. And I ask that because, you know, we've spoken a lot about Bitcoin, but there's also the wider blockchain space, both uh, outside of cryptocurrencies, but also with, with altcoins and various other currencies out there. You know, is this really about the underlying technology or is this just, uh, as you said before, uh, more of a Metcalfe's law sort of network effect that now that there's some popularity and some buzz that it's just spiking and, and rolling on, even though there might be potentially better alternatives out there? Not that I'm buying or shilling for any particular- No, product. look, uh, it, it, yes. I mean, the answer to all your questions is yes. It, it is about the underlying technology. It definitely is about Metcalf's law. It definitely is about adoption and, and first mover advantage. I mean, Paul Romer, right? Professor, former Stanford professor, won the Nobel Prize two years ago. Uh, you know, he, he wrote about this 35 years ago um, in the law of increasing returns. It's not the best technology that wins. It's the technology that gets broadest adoption. Think about Betamax and VHS, right? Betamax was far superior technology, but no one cared because VHS got the deal with Sony. And so there are a lot of examples in history where great technology gets shelved, right? We had electric vehicles in the 1900s in the United States. All the cars in the US were electric. Right? None of them were gas powered. We had the American Electric Automobile Company. A car got about 40 miles to a charge. And then what happened? This guy, Henry Ford, had a friend, John D. Rockefeller. And uh, he said, and uh, Henry Ford had this idea to make a car that would run on grain alcohol. And John D. Rockefeller said, whoa, 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 Hank, you know, um, I have this idea 
that uh, I have this company called Standard Oil and uh, I make kerosene for lamps. And the process of making kerosene, I take this thing, uh, this effluent, and I flush it down the river. It turns out it's flammable. You know, it's called gasoline. And it, it lights rivers on fire and it's, it's really polluting and people are getting these big things on the side of their neck from drinking the water because it's poisonous. So I could really use something. And since it's flammable, we could put it in your car and then I'll give you a piece of my standard oil company. You give me a piece of Ford and, and we'll have this great business. And so it doesn't run on grain alcohol. It runs on gasoline. And what did they do? They bought up all the electric technology and shelved it, right? There's an electric car from the 1900s in the basement of the MIT engineering school as a reminder that that is not new technology. Elon Musk did not invent anything. Now he has popularized it and Metcalf's law again is taken off as more people join that network or that cult uh, as I like to call it. Uh, <laughs> it's a network for the users. The car is nice. Right. The owners of the stock, that's a cult. That's crazy. And that will end badly, but I don't know when, and, and he's been right so far. Um, so this issue of, of, it's absolutely about the technology. Without blockchain technology, without the innovation of blockchain, without the innovation of proof of work, without the innovation of distributed computing and decentralized networks, we would not have Bitcoin. And everybody says, oh, there's going to be something better that comes up. No, there won't. Because even if better technology comes up, it won't do what Bitcoin using blockchain technology does any better. And therefore it won't displace. And everybody says, oh, well, but MySpace had a great product and then, and then Facebook came along. No, no, that's different, right? MySpace had technology, but it was proprietary and it was a closed system. The difference is that's in the old closed system world before open source. You know, we invested in this little company back when I was at, at North Carolina and it's called Red Hat. And you know, it's because the, uh, the CEO had this red fedora. And, and the idea, here was the, here was the pitch from Benchmark Capital to us. We want to invest in this company. It's right there in North Carolina where you are. Uh, and they are going to give away software for free. I'm like, that sounds like a horrible business model. How do you make money? Well, it just sold to IBM for $40 billion. Pretty good business model. And open source says that, that Bitcoin, if anyone comes up with something that would enhance the network or the usability, copy paste. It's open source. So zero chance that the technology gets innovated away. And people talk about hash graph or this. And that doesn't mean those aren't good ideas. And it doesn't mean they might not find a niche, but the core central niche of an ultimate store of value and potentially a medium of exchange. Now, Bitcoin's unlikely to ever be a true medium of exchange because it's slow. When you do computer sure. networks, right? You have, to, you have two choices. You have speed and security. You can't have both, right? Visa, very fast, not secure. How many times have listeners had to get a new Visa or MasterCard number because of fraud? Lots, right? Happens to me every couple of years. But that's okay because it's really fast, right? I don't have to wait. Although it's funny. I don't use my Visa card anymore. I use my Apple Pay because it's way faster at the point of sale. It's just, you know, instantaneous. Whereas I got to wait and have that, that small talk with the cashier that's just uncomfortable. <laughs> the um, I just don't like it. So I don't use my card as much as I, I use Apple Pay. Um, but ultimately, uh, Bitcoin doesn't work, right? It's just too slow, but it's the most secure computing network on the planet, right? Never been hacked, never will be hacked. And we says, oh, quantum computing, eh, not because not, by the time quantum computing actually exists, there'll be a, a fix for, for the network that'll protect it against mm -hmm. quantum the same way we protect it against all the other threats. Uh, distributed networks are, are pretty amazing. So they're very resilient. So ultimately, um, what we have is, is a fundamental technology, blockchain, which is going to change everything. It's going to change everything, right? This whole voting thing that we're going through, right? I mean, there can be no fraud if we have blockchain voting, right? There can be no fraud. And people don't want to go there because... Some people like a little bit of fraud here and there. Now, there's not systemic fraud and all this, you know, trumped up claims about it. it's, it's just silly. You know, in the olden days, right, in the 1800s, yeah, there was some bad voter fraud and, and some rigged elections. No election's been rigged in the United States for, for a long, 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 long time. And, you know, uh, did Trump lose? Yes, he lost. Should he go away quietly? Yes. Is he going to? No. He has a plan. 
and I'm, I'm actually a little scared about this, that he's going to try to change the electors in the Electoral College uh, on December 14th. Uh, it's only happened one other time in history in the 1876 election. Uh, and the Democrats actually won the election, but then conceded because the electors uh, were changed by the Republican governors. And uh, they said, all right, fine, we'll let you have the presidency if you end reconstruction and get the troops out of the South. Um, I don't think there's a big enough trade today between Democrats and Republicans <laughs> to make that happen. So I think Trump's still gonna lose, but I think he's gonna try to uh, still, you know, he's gonna try to steal the election. All right, but that, back to it, blockchain changes everything. Blockchain is an operating system for the internet of value, for the internet of everything. And just like every single one of us uses iOS or Android every single day, just like you and I are using TCP IP, internet protocol, I don't know how it works. I don't really care. But I know that when Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet in 1991, he took Vint Cerf's inv invention, TCP IP, and he wrote the first web page. That was the invention of the internet. And today the internet is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And I don't have to worry about TCP IP being the base layer protocol. And I don't have to worry that there's HTTP and SMTP and FTP and www. and DNS. I don't have to worry about that. The same thing over time is going to be true about blockchain and crypto in the sense that I think Bitcoin may be a base layer technology, a payment rail technology built on top of that will be a second layer, whether it's lightning or whether it's something else. Don't really know. Is it Polkadot? Is it Cosmos? There are lots of projects that are going to be amazing and we'll end up with five. Yeah, I don't know. Is it six? Is that, it doesn't matter. We'll end up with five. Just like TCP IP, HTTP, SMTP, FTP, www. We got, right, what I think is TCP IP, that's BTC. We have the equivalent of www dot, which is ETH. And beyond that, who knows? But are there other projects, utility tokens that are great? Sure. It's just crowdsourced venture capital. 99% of them go to zero, but the ones that don't could be worth a lot of money. So if you want to play in that space, great. We haven't even touched on DeFi. DeFi, sure. complete disruptor for traditional finance. And why? Well, because it's better, right? If, if you and I want to do a contract, why do we need lawyers? Why can't we just have a smart contract that executes, right? People would, used to bet me all the time on stuff. And, and I would always bet a steak dinner. And I haven't paid a lot of steak dinners because I have to remember <laughs> who I made the bet with. And I have to remember what the event was and what the actual number was. And Twitter helps on that. People call me out and say, hey, you owe me. And so I send people certificates for steak dinners. Um, but a smart contract would solve all that. I wouldn't have to write a check. I wouldn't have to make a transfer. It would just execute automatically. And you think about structured products, right? The structured product world is very profitable for the big investment banks, but we could strip out all that intermediary cost and do it online through something like, you know, Barnbridge or Bond. So incredible, incredible innovation going on uh, around decentralized finance that, that's gonna be monstrous. And look, blockchain, is going to do to financial services what the internet did to media and commerce. All the value went from the old traditional companies to the new companies. And the same thing's going to happen in, in financial services. We're going to have new financial services like BlockFi, one of our investments in our fund, right? They are going to be one of the financial services companies in the future, like JP Morgan, C, you know, we talk about mm -hmm. JP Morgan, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, which used to be investment banks. Now they're commercial banks because they bailed out the banking system, which is why Bitcoin got started back in 2009. You know, the chancellor is approving the, the bailout for the banks from the origin block, I mean, the Genesis block. So that's a lot of conversation around a really central point and topic, which is, this is absolutely about technology. This is not going away. This is a technological evolution. It's not a revolution. Revolutions mm -hmm. can fail, right? Coups can fail. Right. Evolutions don't fail. They just happen. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't stop an evolution. It will occur. And it's because better works, right? When something is better, when something improves, you know, think about the whole Darwin thing, right? If if a, if a finch gets a beak that makes it easier to open a seed, guess what? The ones that have bad beaks die off, brutal, but the ones that have good beaks, right? That was a genetic mutation. No one planned for it to happen, but it happened. Here, 
we don't have a genetic mutation. We have something that was actually the genius of who are he, she, they, Satoshi-san happens to be. Um, unbelievable. I mean, the idea of money over internet protocol, value over internet protocol is an extraordinary innovation. I think the most important innovation of the century, easy. So, so then, Mark, I, I guess I want to drill in on, on that for a bit because you know you've you've spoken about the technology, you've spoken about the strength of the underlying tech and their you know inherent capacity for evolution within the tech. But I suppose the question that's always spoken about from inside the industry is how do we get you know quote unquote the next billion people into into yeah. blockchain? How do we get them into into crypto? Yeah. Now, uh, there's sort of two parts of this question because on the first hand, you know we've seen with this current bull run seems to be largely driven by all the metrics that I, I've seen and I deem to be reasonably credible and to be not driven so much by the retail, but much more by the, the institutional buyer yep. really coming in full throttle. That being said, you know, there are still moves to try and get more players uh, involved and more people involved who are perhaps a little less, you know, more risk averse. For right. example, you know, yourselves over at uh, Morgan Creek, uh, you know, released a couple of weeks ago that uh, Exos uh, risk managed Bitcoin fund, yes. uh, an idea that, those people who are a little more risk averse might want to get in. So could you speak to that point and that idea of risk management and getting the next wave of people in? No, it's a fantastic point. And, and, and the reason we launched this fund is, is the one fear that, that investors have right now, uh, I mean, they probably have more than one, but the real one that, that I think stops people from investing is volatility. Yet, what's funny about it is volatility is how you make money, right? If you minimize volatility, you make no return, right? I, I can minimize volatility. I can just put my money in cash, I have zero volatility, and I make no return. So the whole point of investing is taking intelligent risks, risks that you get compensated for, and embracing or seeking volatility. I mean, that's why people own stocks. That's why people own real estate. That's why people own you know, venture capital deals, right? They, they are looking for volatility. Now, the thing about venture capital, right? People put money in venture capital, and they're willing to take incredible risks, right? Could go to zero, right? The company could not work, or you could make you know, five, 10, 20 times your money. But the problem is, or the, the, the benefit is, it's not mark to market. You, know, you don't see the price every day. You get a quarterly statement or, or maybe an update once a year at the annual general meeting, and people don't think about it. Now, the volatility of a venture capital company is way bigger than stocks, way bigger than bonds, way bigger than crypto, way bigger than Bitcoin but you don't see it, right? And if you don't see it, it's out of sight, out of mind. One of the challenges is, you know, the reason we originally started investing in Bitcoin is Bitcoin to us is a venture capital investment. We are making a venture capital investment in a network, right? Not a company, in a network. And the biggest, most valuable companies in air quotes today are networks, right? Amazon is not a company, they're a network. Mm -hmm. Facebook is not a company, it's a network. Apple, it's not a company, it's a network. And it is more valuable as more users get involved. And it's exponential, right? It's not linear. That's the whole Metcalf's law. It's exponential. And so you look at, at how quickly those companies increase in value as they become uh, more ubiquitous, as more people use it. And to your point, how do we get more of the next billion people using crypto? It, it, it's a natural evolution, but it's, it's an exponential graph. And people don't do math very well. Like if I say, what's two times two, you'll say four. If I take, say, what's 17 times 23, you know, uh, and that's, the, that's been proven to be the limit of human intelligence, right? People can't do that without a calculator. If I say, what's nonlinear regression? Oh, probably not very good at that. What about logarithmics? You know, uh, logarithmic math, probably not very good at that. So when people try to think about how um, exponential growth works, they can't really wrap their head around it, right? If I take 20 linear steps down the hall, right? I'm to the other side of the, the room. If I take 20 exponential steps, I go around the world twice. Unbelievable. And people say, that's not right. Well, just do the math. It, it's actually right. And so the thing about getting the next user and the reason that we created the Bitcoin Risk Managed Fund is... There are many people so far who have decided, okay, I'm gonna own Bitcoin and I'm gonna deal with the volatility. I'm not gonna look at it every day. Uh, and those are, are the hodlers, right? right? Those are the people that, that buy and hold or buy and hodl, as I like to say. And uh, they don't worry about day to day. They don't worry about it tick by tick. Now, there are speculators, right? Every market has investors and speculators. 
And I don't think speculation is bad, right? Trading is not bad. Speculating is not bad. Now, what it does, speculating moves price away from fair value uh, in either direction, either up or down. And so, you know, if you speculate on the long side, you may move the price away from fair value to the upside. If you speculate on the downside, on the short side, you could move price away to the downside. But at the end of the day, uh, that volatility is heightened when more speculators come into a market. And one of the challenges for Bitcoin is because there's so many hodlers, there's so many people who are going to not sell at any price, the free float, the percentage of the market capitalization of Bitcoin mm -hmm. that trades is very low relative to the total market cap. And so a small amount can change the price very dramatically, which is why, and that's true of any thinly traded stock. Look at Tesla. The reason it's so volatile, now most of the volatility has been upside volatility, but not all of it, right? It goes down a lot some days, is because so much of it is closely held. In fact, that was the reason it wasn't allowed into the S&P for so long, because it was too closely held and it needed to have more wide distribution. So the same thing's true in Bitcoin. If the average person can move the price with a you know, 10 or 20 or 50 B BTC order, that's a, that's a more volatile market than most people are comfortable with. So what we did is we said, all right, in markets where volatility is high and in markets where trading is dominated by human beings, there are certain strategies called uh, trend following strategies uh, basically, commodity trading advisors popularized them in the 60s and 70s and 80s in the US in the commodity markets, and then it went to bonds and stocks. And for the last decade in traditional assets, CTAs have been horrible, right? Because algorithmic trading and high-frequency trading basically removed trends from markets. Now markets, all the big moves in stocks happen overnight, right? It doesn't happen during the day. During the day, you're basically flat. All the move happens between the open and the close or the close and the open the next day. And so, you know, commodity trading advisor trend following strategies have broken down in the traditional markets. But in Bitcoin, because the incremental buyer and seller is a human being, greed and fear take over. And we tend to get these good trends, both positive and negative. And so you can take advantage uh, of that strategy. And what trend following does, it allows you to truncate the downside, right? When the string starts to trend down, you just get out, right? You go to cash and you wait. And when it starts to trend back up, you get back in. Now, you're going to underperform in the up period, but because you outperform in the down period, you win because math of loss is really hard, right? If you go down 25%, you got to be up 33. You go down 50, got to be up 100. God forbid you go down 90%. You got to be up tenfold to get even, not 10%, not 90%, 10 times. And so avoiding the downside, there's an old adage, and I can't remember who said it, but if you take care of the losses, the gains will take care of themselves. And the most important thing in investing, right, is avoiding the downside. In fact, Roy Newberger, one of my, my heroes in the business, founded Newberger and Berman, went in the office every day till he was 94, right, managed his own money to his 101, finally passed at 106. Um, you know, God rest his soul, unbelievable, brilliant man. And he had this great thing. He said, there are three rules to managing money. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't lose money. Rule number three, don't forget the first two rules. And it's true in everything you do, right? If you can mitigate the downside, the gains will take care of themselves. So we look at Bitcoin as, as a long-term venture capital investment. We think it's like a B or C stage investment in a long-term network. So we mark to market quarterly. We don't look at it every day. And I'm just going to hold it. Now, for a, a speculator, right, someone who wants to trade it, the best way, we think, is to use these trend following strategies, truncate the downside. And so we're giving people through this risk managed fund an ability to invest and get the bulk of the upside, but mitigate the downside. Because what will happen is human beings do two things really, really well. They buy what they wish they would have bought, and they sell what they're about to need. And so invariably, if you just bought and held stocks over the last 20 years, you made six and a half, seven percent. What did the average individual investor make? 2.5. Why? Because they bought when it was high and they sold when it was low because you get afraid. And so if you just bought and held, you'd be better off. But people can't do that, right? Because we're human. So this takes the human out and has a computer saying, when things are ugly, I go to cash. When things are rocking, I get long, I might even use a little bit of leverage. And we compound you know, at, at much better rates. And, and I think what, what's exciting about it is people then uh, can have an asset 
that has a truncated downside. Now that's the, now this is coming. So Barnbridge and Tyler's a friend and I'm actually talking to him later today. Um, you know, he's created this idea, which is just a brilliant idea to take smart contracts and allow people to buy risk managed forms of assets. So structured product forms. So you could mm. buy a low vol Bitcoin. It's absolute genius. Now it's still a ways away. So we've got time to yeah. raise some money in our fund. But when that occurs and I could buy a Bitcoin with 30% vol or 15% vol or 70% vol, right? I could take the vol that other people don't want because I'm going to lock it in a drawer and basically I get free leverage. It's kind of like a CDO or CLO. Um, so incredible innovation coming uh, in the technology. Uh, so certainly uh, so many fascinating innovations going on already that you just alluded to there. However, now I want to spin around and talk about the, the further innovations that, uh, that you're seeing coming. All right. Yeah. So here we are. Yeah, we've gotten to this part of the conversation. It was inevitably coming. This is our December conference. So yep. it's all look ahead to 2021. Mark, I, I want you to hit me with, you know, uh, you, don't, you don't have to give me a specific number, but let's say your, your, your top three-ish, if you've got more, if you've got less, so, uh, do as you will, but innovations and trends that you think need to be looked out for in 2021, uh, you know, and I, I'm sure you will, but building in a lot of what you just spoke about there about, you know, markets going down, markets coming back up, you know, mitigating against losses and risk factors, something we've seen a lot of volatility in 2020. So I'll be interested to see how you break down uh, your views for 2021. Yeah, look, I mean, you know, every every year people say, oh, good riddance. You know, I can't wait for the next year, the new year. And they make their New Year's resolutions and everybody's going to eat right and exercise and and invest better and be more disciplined. And and then by the third week of January, it's all off the table. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, exercise bikes that uh, collect dust and then get sold to play it against sports. So or gym memberships that go unused. But I think this is a year where, where all of us are going to say good riddance and uh, you know, let's, let's get on with it. I think the, 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 the reality is 2021 um, I think is actually going to get worse, not better um, for, for things like lockdowns and uh, you know, this craziness around the virus. And I think that's going to have an impact on the traditional investment worlds. I think it's going to be a very rocky environment for traditional equities uh, I think the only bailout for that would be just massive stimulus from central banks, which I think is certainly possible. So you know, we could keep the Ponzi going for a little longer. Look, you know, we're, we're in a Ponzi finance world. You know, all of the gain of stocks this year is from multiple expansion. You know, earnings were actually down year over year. I think they're going to be down again next year. And so people are just paying for tickers. Right? And, and we've popularized, we've got people like Davey Dave, you know, picking Scrabble tiles out of a bag and buying it and it goes up because other people do it. That's, that's silly, right? That's not investing. I mean, that's, that's gambling, right? That's online gambling. That's just stupid, but, but people are doing it. And, and we've seen this happen before. It happened in 2000. I think we're, we're at the craziness of 2000. Do I think, you know, next year could be like 2001? Yeah, I, I do. And I think we could have a, a really serious bear market in, in the public markets, but, but the, you know, the Fed and other central banks could, could bail it out. So I'm, I'm probably agnostic on, on traditional assets. Uh, what, I, what I'm not agnostic on is, and I'm wildly bullish on is, look, you know, Bitcoin prices and, and you know, Ethereum prices and, and a handful of the other cryptocurrency prices are going to be very strong next year, I mean, very strong. Um, you know, we're gonna be 18 months post halving normal cycle, upturn. Uh, we're going to have the FOMO trade. We're going to have the greed trade coming in. We have a lot of speculators. You know, Google searches for Bitcoin have, have not even come close to what they were uh, back in 2017. That'll happen next year. And uh, everybody and their sister will, will, will be, you know, fear of missing out. Uh, to your point earlier, you know, the big institutional investors, the big hedge fund guys, the big uh, hedge funds themselves, some, you know, very, you know, like Michael Saylor, right? Just absolute legend, just absolute yeah. brilliance. I, mean, I had a huge day the other day. He actually followed me on Twitter. I was like, oh my God, I, I should tweet this out. But I was like, okay, I'm, I'm a fanboy, but but uh, I shouldn't. I probably shouldn't go there. But it was, it made my day. Um, and look, the guy has been a genius for 30 years. I mean, he started a company way ahead of its time, business intelligence for executives, uh, the idea of distributed networks and the power of collective intelligence way ahead of his time. Yeah, 
my favorite thing, and he did this podcast where he talked about, he had this idea that, uh, you know, the internet was probably not going away and that the English language probably not going away. So what if I bought words on the internet? So I bought domain names, hope.com. And my favorite was voice.com. So he bought voice and he just held it for a decade. And then someone came and offered him 150 K and he said, Oh, no way. I'm just selling it for that. Long story short, he sold it for $30 million, $30 million. And the company that bought it has made 10, 20, 30, 50 times that um, by having that as their, uh, website because it it goes to the top of the Google search. So all he did is he Google searched and found you know what had the most hits and he bought those words. The guy's a genius. So he figured out that uh, what what I and others have figured out you know uh, a while back that cash you know as Ray, Ray Dalio said famously at WEF is trash in the sense that every day you own it you're getting devalued away by the central banks. And so as a fiduciary, see here's the great thing. He, as a fiduciary, got off zero. That's my big hashtag, get off zero. As a fiduciary, you will be deemed irresponsible a decade from now, maybe not even a decade, maybe only five years from now, if you don't own Bitcoin. Just let that sink in, right? People think you're being radical if you buy it today. No, 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 you're being a good fiduciary. Because if you own cash or bonds, and he goes through this on, on his multiple podcasts, uh, just the genius of realizing that he had an obligation to his shareholders to preserve the value of those assets generated by his business. And you know, ob ob obviously that has been the right decision and, and will continue to be the right decision. And as other companies follow that lead next year, whew, big, 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 big. So, so I'm, I'm very comfortable uh, saying that it's gonna be another, another great year for, for Bitcoin and, and crypto. You know, I think in terms of big innovations, I, th I think the, the biggest innovation next year is, is probably uh, some significant progress on kind of that, that uh, second layer uh, technology for payment rails. And I think you're going to see a lot more blockchain oriented payment solutions. You know, you've already seen it a little bit with Square and, and, uh, and things like that and Cash App, but, but I think a true uh, decentralized payments rail, I think is, is likely next year. Uh, I think this innovation in, um, in structured finance and DeFi is going to continue to, to just rock. Uh, and I know you guys, you know, you didn't have, and Patrick, I, I give Patrick some grief on this, you know, he didn't have me on the DeFi show and I was actually kind of hurt because um, I'm a TradFi guy, you know, being disrupted by DeFi. So I do have some views on that, but I, I, I think it's, it's absolutely positively one of the, the big developments for next year. And look, at the end of the day, you know, 2024, right, which is still three years from now, is the beginning of the wave, right? If you go back to my, my timeline, 54 mainframe, 68 microchip, 82 personal computer, 96 internet, 2010 mobile net, 2024 is the trust net. And that's when everything through this collective intelligence is, is brought together. Um, that's still three years from now. And then it's four years after that where we get the big crash and the bust, uh, kind of like the 2000 break after the 1996 internet. But our best investments uh, were made in those early 90s when we invested in Yahoo and, and eBay and, and made huge investments in internet technology before anyone even knew what the internet was. We didn't even know what the internet was at the time. We just knew that, yeah, a digital version of, of a garage sale that could be a big business someday. Um, and I may have to resort to eBay this year. My son wants, I have a nine-year-old and he wants a PS5 and you can't get one. Literally, you can't yeah, get that's one. That's a tough sell. Because the bots bought them all and are reselling them on eBay. And so I'm going to have to pony up, you know, 3X the, <laughs> the sticker price unless Sony can, can fix their supply chain and get me a PS2 for Christmas. But uh, I don't know. I, I'm probably willing to pay it because I'm a, I'm a schmuck, but... Uh, uh, it's okay. You got to you got to keep the kids happy. I mean, you got to you know, keep the kids happy. This is what they know. They're the butts they know. Uh, but no, I will say first and foremost, Patrick is still it's still eating him up inside that he didn't invite you to that DeFi uh, conference. He he spoke to me earlier today and said, "I can't believe it." Apologized to Mark and my oh, no problem. Here's my here's my formal apology again from Patrick. You should have been on there. And 
Uh, fortunately, we'll, we've got plenty more uh, scope for- hey, Look, for, I, you, you can't give me all the airtime. I, I, I appreciate <laughs> the opportunities uh, you provide. I, I love these conversations. You guys do such great homework. You're so well prepared. You keep the conversation uh, headed on, on all the right topics. And I, I just think what you guys are doing at Reimagine is, is truly extraordinary. Well, much appreciated, Mark. And, and I guess on that note, uh, let's, let's ride out on the high. I want to thank you so much for joining us for this uh, fifth iteration of the conference. You know, uh, we're looking forward to 2021 ourselves. There'll be tons of innovation in this space, uh, plenty to watch out for. And whether it is a, a dark and gloomy image in the, in the year ahead or whether it's a, a crazy bull one run we can all ride out, it will certainly be exciting times nonetheless. So, Mark Yusko, thanks so much for being with us. And uh, for everyone watching, make sure you stick with the whole conference. There's so many good uh, interviews to watch, so, so much good content to view. So make sure you stay watching with Reimagine 2020. Thanks very much.